Go ahead. Oh, we can. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, our seminar presentation today. I'll just before our presentation by our guest speaker, I'll just give like a brief introduction into our student association, our student uh, community, and also the resources that we have for students and for faculty. Yeah. So the name of our association is uh, Galloglee College of Engineering Graduate Student Community. And we have like a leadership team that usually help with organizing a lot of programs such as the seminar, faculty mixer, and also the international food evening. So Roshan and Rachel are our co-chair. And I'm sure you've been receiving like a lot of mails regarding our seminar presentation. Uh, Andrew and Avinash are in charge of that. And also we have like a group of graduate students that are supporting. And our faculty mentor is uh, Professor Farouk uh, Mistry. So for our regular meeting, we usually have a meeting every week and it's usually on Wednesday at uh, 5.15 p.m. So the meeting are usually held on Zoom to accommodate uh, everyone's time. And if you want to join the meeting, we can usually contact uh, Rachel uh, or Russian for the invitation. And just in case, like if the time doesn't work for you, we, uh, we usually set the time to accommodate everyone. So we can always change the time. It's very flexible for everyone. So to become a G, uh, GCOE GSE member on Engage, uh, so what you just have to do is you just have to scan this QR code or you can click on this link. So we'll be sharing this link uh, into the message section. So you just have to log in with your OUID and click join and you are a member of GSE. Uh, we also have uh, a LinkedIn group for the GCOE GSE uh, so you just have to scan this QR code and also uh, click join. We have like, we usually put like a lot of resources on our LinkedIn profile also. On our Facebook page also to join, we have a group on Facebook, the OUAME GSE uh, graduate students community. And you just have to scan this QR code. Uh, on our Facebook page, we usually have like a lot of activities that we usually do. Uh, last week, Friday, we just have a graduate student faculty mixer so to keep updates with all our activities and seminar presentation, uh, you can you should join our uh, Facebook page also. So the GCOE GSE also, we have a YouTube page uh, where we upload a lot of presentations to keep track, just in case you want to uh, follow up with presentation that you miss. We usually upload them after the presentation. So you can click on subscribe and you can uh, scan the QR code to have access to the page. So as part of the resources that we provide for our graduate students, uh, we have the Dave and Susan uh, bedroom, which is available for uh, GSE members to use. Uh, we have a lot of amenities there. We have the couches, whiteboard, coffee pot, microwave. And just in case you want to take a break from your research, uh, we, have, we have you covered. So if you want access to the, uh, to the room, uh, you just need to email the chairman and the co-chair, Rachel and uh, Rachel and uh, Roshan, or you can email the uh, faculty mentor also, Professor Farouk. So just a uh, reminder, there is a link that will be sent into the message. You can please sign in uh, via the Google form LinkedIn chat. And today would, uh, our guest speaker is Professor Brian Watson. And the title of presentation is Using Biological Inspired Design to Increase the Resilience of Critical Infrastructure and a brief introduction about uh, Prof. Watson. He's a professor of system engineering and electrical engineering and computer science uh, at Embry Radio Aeronautical University. So I will stop sharing my screen now uh, for Professor Watson. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Professor Watson. So you can share your screen. Excellent. Yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Let's get this set up and we can get going. I see very good. Um, just to verify, you're able to see the presentation? Yeah, we are able to see. Excellent. Yeah. All right, well, uh, like it was mentioned, my name is Brian Watson. Uh, I am an assistant professor here at Emory Riddle Aeronautical University, and I'm uh, honored and excited to be able to be here uh, to talk to you all about some of the research that we've been doing. Uh, so it, I always like to start a little bit with, you know, how my past directs my current research. And before I went back to graduate school, I was actually in the submarine force for about eight years. 
Uh, and so that really, that time was critical for me, helping me think about, uh, starting to think about certain questions, which I would later come to look at in my research. Uh, and so really what I started thinking about was the impact of cascading failures. Uh, and so any, any good submariner will tell you that the, the real indication that something has gone wrong is the circulation fans turning off, right? If the air conditioning fans turn off, that means you've got a problem, right? You've also got alarms and other indications, but when the fans turn off, things are a problem. So I was uh, on, the, on the boat getting some food. I heard the fans uh, turn off and I decided to go back and see uh, what was going on. And we figured out the following sequence of events had occurred. Right, we saw that a there was a trash can in the engine room, and the trash can supposed to be emptied every couple hours, but it hadn't been emptied. Somebody came by with their uh, energy drink can, and instead of throwing the energy can away in another trash can or emptying the trash can, they decided to do the thing where you balance the trash on top of the pile of trash in your trash can. We've all done this, right? Well, the can fell off, rolled across the floor, fell into a gap, and went next to something that was moving. Now, it wasn't causing any damage, but it was making a, a new a sound that the, uh, the operators didn't expect. So of course they turned that uh, piece of equipment off and that directly impacted some of the missions we were able to uh, accomplish while we were investigating that problem. And so we see a very tiny uh, individual fault cascades and cascades and cause some major consequences. Another example from, uh, from the world, right? Is uh, you can look at these eight products and ask yourself, what do they have in common? Give everybody a few seconds to think about it. All right, so these were all industries impacted by uh, cascading faults caused by the grounding of the Ever Given. All right, so those of you who aren't familiar with the event, right, in 2021, uh, the Ever Given ran aground and it was stuck for about 11 days and it blocked the Suez Canal. Uh, now, what this is important, right, because about 12% of the world's uh, shipping cargo travels through the Suez Canal. And during that uh, 11 day blockage, they needed to take a three week detour around the Horn of Africa rather than going through the Suez Canal, impacting about $9 billion worth of goods a day. So, you have a single ship getting stuck having a global impact. If you go back to the previous slide, you'll see one of the, the industries that was impacted actually was COVID response. Several hospitals had to change their COVID response strategy because of the delays in receiving personal protective equipment, right? And all those companies I showed there, they specifically mentioned these supply chain issues when they were uh, discussing their quarterly revenue. So we think about cascading faults, we know they're important. Um, I wanna talk about one other idea, which is systems of systems. So this get, makes it even more complicated for us. So systems of systems are there as this idea that we can combine constituent systems and they want to exchange energy, material, money, or information. So if I go back to my submarine example, that submarine is a system, right? There's, it has many parts, but they all interact deterministically. Whereas if I combine them into a carrier strike group, now I'm in dealing with a system of systems, right? Now they have all these various constituent systems. They all interact. Each constituent system has autonomy and they're exchanging, in this case, mostly information. So we, the world we live in, right, is composed of systems of systems. And what we're interested in in our group is how do we increase the resilience of these systems of systems? Um, it's a good idea to always define terms at the start of a talk. So resilience is our ability to resist a fault, minimize disruption, and recover. So we could have our system performance. We're measuring some sort of uh, metric of interest, right? A fault will occur, performance will degrade, and then to, through actions by the operators or through the system itself, the system will recover. What we're interested in is the ability to make the degradation from the fault not as severe and speed the recovery. Those two together, we create the idea of resilience. Now, resilience um, is one of those things, if you tell someone we need to design for resilience, um, I think we all agree that that's a known, known thing that's needed inside systems uh, engineering and system design. But what's really interesting is that this is an area that has well recognized as requiring significant work still to be done, right? Um, it talks about the fact, even standard definitions, right? If you get a bunch of resilience engineers in the room and start talking about how do you measure resilience, you'll have a very lively conversation, right? Um, and specifically, um, one of the things that's called out is research, which will enable the discovery of emergent effects before it's constructed. And we'll talk about what we mean by emergence here in a moment. Um, one of my favorite quotes about complex system resilience is from 2003, where the imagery is striking and then the current literature still, still tends to agree with the sentiment that the current state of design of complex systems is analogous to civil engineering prior to the advent of physics and calculus when major structures such as bridges were built without any way to predict their performance. So in other words, what, I, what I'm saying is we are really good at designing complex systems, at designing these systems of systems at figuring out ways to transfer transfer information, energy, money, and material 
but often we don't know how they're going to respond to faults until the fault occurs. And this is a major challenge. Now with this, um, in this seminar, we're going to discuss five things. Um, the first, we're going to talk about why this is hard to fix. Why haven't we already figured out some, some um, robust ways to design for resilience? Right? And what's our proposed group's approach to increasing resilience of systems? The second thing we're going to do is talk about, well, how does that approach compare to the current approaches to design for resilience? Um, then we'll talk about how do you take inspiration from ecosystems to increase resilience and how do you take inspiration from individual uh, insects or insects in this case, but individuals within nature to increase resilience. And finally, we'll briefly talk about some future work or kind of the vision for a biologically inspired, inspired design for resilience. So let's talk about first our proposed approach to increase resilience. And we have to talk about why this is still a problem, right? It's 2023, why are we still investigating this? So we're invested. One of the key things that makes uh, designing for resilience difficult is that it's an emergent property. So what does that mean? An emergent property, let's go on to our next slide. So emergence, if we were to define it, it's the act of producing system effects that are approximately underivable based on system components and their interrelationships. So if we look at this flock of birds here, we can understand the logic of each bird but we won't understand the higher level system patterns until we consider the system as a whole. That emergent property in this case of the, of the video we're showing is the spatial distribution. Let me give you another example of emergence. So we had a, a lovely time at the beginning doing introductions and we got to meet everybody. And so if we were in a room together, what I would tell you is look around and pick two people in the room and tell yourself in your mind, this person's person A and this person's person's B. And I want you to move around the room. You can do this later when you're when you're on the, the quad at OU. Uh, I want you to move around the room such that you always keep A between me and B. So A should be your protection between from you and uh, person B. So if you do that, you'll see something like this, some sort of random random meandering around the space, right? And you can you can run this experiment for yourself. Now, if you change the rules slightly and say, okay. Now I want you to put yourself between A and B and you do this base a very small change rather than having A protect you from B, now you're protecting A from B. If you do that and then run an experiment, what you'll see is you'll see something that looks like this, some sort of clustering. Now it could be multiple nodes depending on the way people pick their partners, um, but you'll see this spatial uh, organization on a system level. And of course you would now, most people, when I show them this example say, well, I understand that now. Now, I, now, I, now that I've seen it simulated out, I understand why that occurs. But the complication with the emergency system level properties is that as the rules become more complicated, complexity it all is much more difficult to anticipate what the uh, system level effect is gonna be. So for example, I might give you the rule of, hey, okay, not only do you have to stay between A and B, but you have to stay five units from B. Or I might say, I want you to do your best to protect A from B and C, right? So now it's even harder to understand uh, what's gonna happen on a system level. To make things even more or even worse, emergence occurs at both the system and the system of system level. So what we mean by that, if we look at our systems here, systems are composed of the interactions between agents, that's things with autonomy, the environment and technical entities. And we'll talk a little bit more about what these are as we go forward. These three elements, however, interact to create emergence on a system level, right? And those could be system level things like uh, temporal organization. However, as we talked about, our world is composed of systems of systems. We don't just have one complex system. We have multiple complex systems that interact together. These all interact in a system of systems by exchanging energy, material, money, or information. And the result of those interactions is also emergence. And that creates system of system level properties like resilience, sustainability, reliability. So we're interested in the prop, uh, property of resilience. This is an emergent property from the interaction of systems. Oh, by the way, the, um, the interaction of lower level constituents of a system also cause emergence. So emergence can propagate upward to cause major system, civil, system level uh, per, uh, performance changes. So I always like to pause here, and I, I know many of you are from mechanical and aerospace engineering. And so why are we talking about emergence to uh, mechanical and aerospace engineers? And I would argue that this, this actual problem applies to all engineers. So I think we all have a role as engineers inside designing these complex systems. So we might be designing the agents, right? So maybe, you're, maybe your work looks specifically at sensor networks, mobile robotics, things like that, things that are able to make those autonomous decisions. 
You might working on the environment, right? And that could be both actually controlling the environment through climate control or the sensors which sense the environment for the agents, right? Or you might be working on technical artifacts, right? Maybe you're working on um, a plant that these robots are working inside of. All engineers, right, I think work somewhere inside these complex systems and our work directly contributes to it. Okay, that's great. So I'm in the complex system, but my, 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 more, my second point is that if we don't consider emergence, our work as engineers can be undermined. A great example of this is the Broughton Bridge collapse in 1831. So we think about this, this thing, the entity was this bridge in Britain, right? The environment was the temperature, the atmospheric conditions, and the agent choices was they had a group of soldiers marching in unison, right? And what the emergent property was, was they actually hit the harmonic frequencies of the Broughton Bridge. And of course, this is Tacoma Narrows, a different bridge that had some harmonic uh, issues. Uh, but my point is the, the engineers can do everything they, they want to to design that bridge correctly, but if they don't consider the way that these things are interacting inside of a complex system, all their design efforts are for naught, and they won't achieve their design objective. So I would argue that all of us as engineers need to be aware of emergence and consider it when we are entering the design process. Now, if we go back to why is it hard to, uh, to engineer emergence, there's really two approaches. Uh, well, there's no, many ways that that people organize these approaches, but we'll classify them into two for today's talk. The two approaches we'll use is number one, we can change the rules agents follow. So maybe I'm always still gonna interact with A and B, but as an agent, I'm gonna change the rules I follow. The other thing we can change is who I interact with. So maybe my rules stay the same, but now I'm interacting with more, uh, more different uh, entities. So, one, one of our, uh, I guess, key theories in our group is that biologically inspired design provides a fundamentally different approach to resilience engineering. So if we think about our complex system, and this is just a different way to show the same image from before, we have our agents, the agents makes observations about other agents, they make observations about the environment, and they choose a behavior, right? They make some sort of action in the world. Then through the proper process of emergence, these agents actions all interacting, we end up with system level behavior or system of system level behavior we care about, right? In our case, we care about resilience. Now, current approaches often say, okay, I know I want resilience. Can I understand the black box of emergence in order to be able to uh, determine uh, uh, what strategies I should use? So starting with resilience, examining emergence to determine strategies. Our approach says, okay, let's start with biological inspiration. Let's find biological approaches that improve resilience in nature. If we find those behaviors that improve resilience in nature, let's apply them to artificial systems and see if we get the same resilience. So if it supports resilience in nature, will it support resilience in artificial systems? Our approach does not attempt to understand the inner workings of emergence. Rather, we're focused on the end goal of system level behavior, which is resilience. Of course, because we're using different approaches, we also use significantly different tools, right? We'll use biologically inspired design, heuristics, functional decomposition. Um, we, we do keep computer modeling in common. Uh, cur current approaches often have much more of a game theory, open dynamic, machine learning, things like that. So a little bit of a vision statement here, right? So what we wanna do is we wanna protect people from unexpected faults by leveraging those design solutions found in nature. So here's an example of a, a low resilience system of systems. We have our water, our factory, our energy, and our communications. So current approaches might say, okay, let's increase the number of, of water uh, plants. Let's make this uh, link harder to disrupt. Let's increase the capacity of the power plants. We have standby power available. Let's increase the number of connections. So if one fails, then we're able to still uh, maintain a information flow or energy flow between these two. And that works, right? That will increase resilience. But the problem is it doesn't scale very well. As your system continues to grow in size and complexity, your cost continues to grow greater than linearly, right? So this is not a sustainable solution as our, now, as our systems of systems continue to grow and become ever more present. Our approach says, okay, rather than changing capacity or links, let's look at nature, right? Can we take some behaviors inspired by ant colonies to increase resilience? Can we, if we're gonna make a change to the, the network structure, can we do things inspired by uh, food webs? Specifically, we're gonna talk about two different ways, right? We're gonna change who the systems interact with. And for that, we're gonna look at ecosystems. How are ecosystems arranged and how can we mirror those uh, arrangements to improve, improve resilience? And the second thing we're gonna do is change the rules agent follow. So we'll look specifically at individual agents in nature or species level behavior, see how they can impact resilience. 
Before we get into either of those, I want to talk about comparing the traditional approaches. Uh, I made the statement that traditional approaches don't scale well, but we should actually look at how our, how our proposed approach uh, compares to traditional approaches if we're going to uh, say we should use it in the world. So when we look at how engineers have tried to increase resilience, they typically do it in two ways. They use hard resilience and soft resilience. So hard resilience, like I said, looks at those examples from the previous figure were examples of hard resilience. Can we make the system more robust? Can we harden the system? Can we add redundancy? Can we uh, include additional ability for communication? So hard res soft resilience, however, looks at how can we respond to the fault? Can we detect it faster? Can we respond faster? Either through augmenting the humans who interact with the system or through software or uh, machine learning based approaches. Now, we're going to compare these two approaches, but it's important for us to uh, have a, well, I like to use case study based approaches. I think it's, it's nice to have, be able to tie both uh, your theory to an actual case study. And we're looking at a model of a forestry, a Swiss forest industry for this particular uh, paper that we're discussing. So in this uh, paper, I know we have someone here said there are system dynamics modeler as well, but we have six constituents. We have a forestry constituent, lumber mill, paper mill, uh, a use of the timber, a use of the paper, and an incinerator. The links here, um, not to worry too much about the numbers, but they show the flow between the various constituents. And so when we're building this model, we realized that there were seven parameters inside the model that corresponded with traditional resilience approaches, right? Both the incinerator capacity, recycling rates, our conservation efforts, right? Their fault response speed and the response dynamics. Um, and so this is going to kind of give us a way to, to say, okay, we know these parameters. We can then change these parameters to see how it impacts resilience. It's important to know uh, with the impact resilience, we can't measure the impact of something unless we have an approach to measure it. Uh, today, we're going to, whenever we say resilience, we're talking about a custom resilience metric that our group developed. Um, and this custom resilience metric is called the system of system resilience metric. I won't go into all the details here on the derivation. Um, you can see all that in the IEEE systems journal. But what I will say essentially is what it does is it uses the network structure to determine how long a fault should be inserted for and how long the recovery effort should take, and then looks at the uh, disruption to link faults. So specifically, we're looking at resilience to link faults between constituents uh, whenever we talk about the system of system resilience measure. Now, when we look at biologically inspired design, we're looking for a process analogical transfer. We wanna take something from nature and transfer it over to something in the artificial world that helps us uh, achieve some sort of design objective. So a classic example is a Kingfisher and the Shinkansen train. They had issues uh, with noise from the uh, sonic boom from the train. And so they looked at the Kingfisher's beak and modeled the nose of the train to help with uh, drag problems. Now, I want to point out that, that when we do analogical transfer, we have to do it well. So we're taking the shape of the Kingfisher beak. We're not taking the color. We're not putting feathers, right? And, and a key challenge here is we have to say, OK, we said ecosystems are an inspiration, but what do we mean by that? And what characteristics of ecosystems are actually suitable for analogical transfer? If you transfer something from nature that doesn't help you solve the design problem, you haven't accomplished anything. And so for this particular study, what we said is, okay, let's look at the functional roles within ecosystems. And we look at functional roles, uh, there's a variety of them. Primary producers go to primary consumers, right? You go up kind of your food chain or food web here. And then these all create what's called detritus. Detritus is non-living organic matter. And there's these things called detrital actors or decomposers that feed on that non-living organic matter, right? And they, they create a basically a path for material and energy recycling within the network. So if you look at the forest industry, what you notice is that there is no constituent that fulfills the role of the detrital actor. The incinerator really is set up to be an apex predator, uh, but there's no nothing that fulfills the detrital actor role. So what we did is we said, okay, let's let's convert the incinerator from an apex predator into a detrital actor. And we're going to do that with adding a simulation of a mulching process. So there's evidence that uh, mulching and can be used to help promote growth in forests. So we said, okay, let's use that to help promote the growth of the forestry constituent rather than burning all of the uh, paper and lumber waste. So fairly uh, low cost, technolo technically simple uh, change made to the system. Now, whenever we evaluate design options, um, what we're doing is we're going to evaluate them in a, a platform called AnyLogic. It's a uh, hybrid modeling platform based on uh, Java. Uh, and what this one here particularly is gonna be a system dynamics model. What you can see in the system here is just an example run 
where you have the different levels of the constituent uh, systems changing in response to a fault. The, the link is broken, the systems change, Oops. and then the link is restored. And this data is used to help us understand the resilience of the system. This current uh, configuration here shows after we added the flow back to the uh, forestry system from the incinerator system. Anytime you develop a system dynamic model, right, it's really important, any model, right? It's really important to have good uh, foundations mathematically. Uh, one area that's really important for, for resilience is the system engineer or the constituent st stakeholders really have to define what do they mean when they say resilience, what are we trying to be resilient to? And that's really something you can't take the human out of the process. They have to be able to define it. Uh, for this particular case study, um, each constituent was given a different, uh, what's called measure to performance on how it, how it performed that we can measure the resilience or the impact of. Now these measures of performance sometimes depended on flows between the constituents and sometimes uh, depended on the levels within. So for example, the, the lumber uh, producing constituent here, this lumber mill, all they care about is making money based on selling lumber, right? So that was the primary driver for their measure of performance. Whereas the timber cons uh, consumption depends upon the level of uh, timber in use, making sure we meet the needs of the housing in the area or other lumber use uh, facilities. Of course, we also went through and defined, carefully defined the uh, equations to govern the flows between all the different constituents. Um, a couple of things I would I would mention here just briefly, right? Of course, sometimes the flows are, de are dependent upon other flows. So for example, we can't recycle lumber if we're not losing lumber, right? There has to be a, a function of how much lumber is actually going out of circulation at a given time. And then we used a proportional controller uh, throughout this uh, to maintain the levels, the standing stock in X2 and X3. That's the safety stock that they maintain um, to ensure they can continue production. Now let's look at the results here. So the biologically inspired redesign resulted in a slight improvement of resilience over traditional approaches, right? So we're looking at 0 0.922, 0 0.926, uh, a difference of about $100,000 uh, lost after fault per, and that's per year of faulted time, right? So these, these fault values, uh, dollar values, are if you had a fault for a year, what would the impact in, in the, um, the system be? Now that's, that's a small change, but then we have to look at what do we actually do to each system? The biologically inspired approach, we added a mulching uh, path. For a traditional approach, uh, we ran it through an optimization algorithm for those seven parameters we talked about. And to get the, op the highest resilience possible, you have to have no delay in responding to demand. You, can, you have to be able to deforest almost completely this forestry industry. You have to assume that 80% of all paper waste can be recycled. And the, the reason I show this is to show that yes, uh, you know, that's a small improvement, uh, but also the, some of the assumptions for the real world would be technically very challenging to implement as opposed to uh, mulching. So this first study was really important for us because it showed, okay, we can, we can make improvements over the status quo system using biologically inspired design that's technically simpler to implement uh, and with greater than or, or comparable resilience gains. Uh, so that was the first thing we did is, okay, the, how does it compare to the traditional approaches? The next thing we said was, okay, let's look at graph theory and system system network structure. Uh, we're looking specifically at ecosystems as we look at this uh, portion of the talk here. So recall, we said, okay, we want to model things from ecosystems to help us improve uh, the network structure. That's fantastic. And we found that the, the trital actor role was one we can add, but that's not very general guidance. And it requires you to go into the system that you're looking at and identify the functional roles that each constituent takes. So that, that tends to take a bit of uh, domain knowledge and it makes it a little bit less accessible. So what we did, there's been some previous work that's looked on ecological network analysis and looking at how ecosystems are evolved. And we kind of built on this uh, previous work by uh, Leighton, uh, another uh, academic uh, grandchild uh, featured in this talk. Uh, so for this, there's 20 ecological network analysis metrics. Uh, and those are a form of graph theory. And we're really gonna divide these into structure matrix and flow matrix. What this does is it lets us take an ecosystem, which is a, which is a complicated structure and really uh, drill down into several different uh, numbers, which characterize the, uh, the, both the shape and performance of the ecosystem. We went back to our forestry case study and we said, okay, let's create these things called design variants. So what a design variant is, is we're making a minor change that still has the same objective of the design. So for example, we can remove this link here and increase the uh, inflow into X2, therefore keeping the remainder of the flows the same, still having the um, remainder of the system perform the same function, which is 
the uh, forestry output for this this, uh, this uh, Swiss region. And this is really important because as we remove these different links, we end up with different ENA values and different resilience values because the network slightly changed. So we found five links we could remove in this manner, and that gave us 16 design variants. For each, we evaluated both the ENA metrics and resilience. When we did that, we found 13 uh, correlations that could be used to guide uh, design. So for example, rather than saying, find the, find the uh, constituent that fulfills the role of the trital actor or added the trital actor, what we said is, okay, let's take the graph theory of mean path length and let's reduce mean path length. Let's increase uh, vulnerability, reduce alpha, all right? And all the definitions for these are given in the paper themselves. But the point is this lets us take a mathematical foundation for the evolution that we wanna do to our system. And the goal is that if you're looking at making a change to your system of systems, uh, you can look at your current uh, network structure, look at the proposed network structure, see how it interacts with these design guidance and help that helps you make a low fidelity estimate on if you're going to make resilience uh, improved or 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 uh, degraded. Now, of course, it's great to find correlations, but it, it, you know, we're going to need to validate the, this recommendation. Uh, the paper that we published has three validation studies. For uh, sake of time, we'll discuss two today. So the first thing we did was generated 100 uh, random graphs. Then we did a random change and a change following the design heuristic and measured the resilience. And what we did is basically compared, does following the design heuristic for these random networks result in an improved resilience over just a random change? When we did that, we found that of the 13 tested heuristics, nine were effective, three were effective but not statistically significant, and one was ineffective. The next validation test we did was we looked at two more models of real world systems of systems, and we redesigned those using that design guidance from the previous table. And then we remeasured resilience. When we did that, we saw that resilience increased from 0 0.740 to 0 0.881 on the North American copper industry. And on the Austrian plastic, uh, plastic flow, we also saw an increase in resilience. So basically with this process, we sat down and we said, okay, here's your original. Look at how you could redesign this. And we made sure the redesign followed the design, the design guidance that we had previously found through the correlations. And then from there, we tested to see if it actually increased resilience. So with this, right, we found 13 designed for resilience heuristics that can help improve system of systems resilience. Um, this table here just shows the evidence for each. Gray indicates that it's supported by the different tests. White indicates that the result was not statistically significant. So we've talked about ecosystems. But let's talk about actual individual behavior because, you know, with the advent of multi-agent systems, robotic swarms, a lot of these become very interesting, especially because because often we can't use the network structure. Right? If I try and use network structure to increase resilience of a communication network between drones, that's not going to work because the network structure is always shifting. So I need to look more at fundamental individual behavior. Like we've talked about before, right? the key challenge, identifying the natural inspiration suitable for ideological transfer. The approach we use in our group is called functional decomposition. So for functional decomposition, what we're going to do is we're going to look in the natural domain and we're going to look at what behaviors biologists and others have observed. We're going to take those behaviors, we're going to abstract them into functions. What function are they trying to achieve? From there, we'll take those functions, transfer them to an artificial domain, and then apply them via tactics. In the example we'll talk about today, we identified six uh, specific strategies for system resilience. Uh, for those of you who have not uh, seen uh, analogical transfer, or excuse me, functional decomposition before, what we're looking at, and the, the tool we use specifically, is called the why how ladder. So, for example, if I were to say I want the function is drive to work, how do I do that? I keep fuel in the tank. How do I do that? I read my gauge and I refill my tank. So, going down answers the question how, going up answers the question why. For this work, we started with a literature review of a use social insect behavior. And specifically, we just asked the question, in general, how do you social insects promote resilience? When we did that, we identified six categories that influence you social insect resilience, genetics, learning experience, task specialization, time limitations, spatial, and amplification. We were able to take those and identify 17 tactics that you could use to increase resilience. I won't run through all these here. Um, they're presented in terms of generic agent-based modeling terminology in order to uh, make it more transferable across different contexts. 
So let's talk about six of these uh, today. So we're going to talk about specifically about individual behavior. What what are the in choices we can program into individuals with their if they're machines or robots or age and any type of agent to help improve the resilience of the system? Once again, uh, I like to apply these to a case study so we can actually see the results. And for this, we looked at a, an agent-based model of electric man motor manufacturing supply chain. And the supply chain starts with raw materials. The subassemblers take those and use them to produce one of four primary components, rotors, stators, shields, or bases. From there, we get to the subassemblers, subassemblers and drive assemblies and case assemblies to so the final assemblers. At this point, the completed motors are sent through the system in use. Some percentage goes to recycle, and then the remainder goes to waste. The recycling components goes back to the subassemblers. I like this uh, case study for a couple of reasons. Um, it is a single currency case study. It's complicated enough that we get some interesting dynamics and cascading effects, uh, but not so complicated that it makes it difficult to explain or, or work with. Uh, the other thing I really like about it, it's been well-validated, uh, appeared in some previous journal papers uh, by other authors as well. Uh, and so let's give ourselves some agents and give them an impact. So what we did is we, when we initialized the model, we gave each of the 20 constituent systems 25 agents. We said there are 25 individuals who work at this supplier, at this subassembler, at this distributor, so on and so forth. And what we let the agents do through internal logic is decide if they needed to change which constituent they worked for. So for example, if the link from one to nine is broken, then these agents should probably decide that it'd be better for them to go to two or go to 10 or go to 14, right? Because they're no longer providing value at this case here. Now, the way they impact the production of each of these different constituents is uh, through this type of curve here, where we have diminishing returns, but also acknowledging that you need a certain number of critical mass in order to actually have production as well. Maximum value is double the initial value for each, uh, each individual constituent. And by that, I mean in terms of output per week. Now, what we're looking at is we're going to compare status quo behavior to these biologically inspired behaviors that we got from looking at you social insects. So for example, here we have our uh, any logic model. In this case, it's a hybrid model. You're seeing the system dynamics influenced by the agent-based model running in the background. In this case, this link is broken. You can see that this, uh, this uh, agent is no longer, this constituent is no longer being used. And the remainder are attempting to compensate by having agents move around the system in order to maintain the same sales and same amount in circulation. Now, for six of these tactics, we saw an increase in resilience of about 5 to 6 percent, 0.64 to 0.53, or expected savings of $165 million per year faulted, and that's based on the uh, 20,000 motors per week sold. Uh, what's interesting or, or especially compelling to me is that a lot of these do not require additional equipment or training. They basically require a change in procedure. So, for example, in this strategy here, very parameters, what we did was rather than give all the agents uniform logic, we had the logic change uh, throughout the agents so they had a distributed response to the environmental stimulus. Same thing here, right? Their parameters were able to evolve over time in response to basically learning uh, if changing uh, helped, helped out the system or not, right? And so we're looking at uh, behaviors or techniques that uh, have minimal or low cost compared to the expected gain. Uh, so in summary, right, we're looking at the two different approaches based on ecosystem, based on agent logic. Uh, we see that we have 30 strategies altogether we, we talked about today, um, both heuristics for network structure that we talked about with uh, the two different validation tests and then agent logic, which we talked about with the, uh, the agent-based model of the electric motor manufacturing supply chain. So what, what's, what's the vision here, right? The vision is that we want to apply these together to increase system of system resilience. Uh, and we're calling this biologically inspired design for resilience, right? So we go back to our hypothetical low resilient system of system. So rather than just increasing our material infrastructure, what we're going to say is, okay, let's, let's look at our filter rotation strategy informed by ant colony task allocation. Let's add a link here inspired by the decomposer functional group. Let's add a link here inspired by ecosystem graph structure. Maybe we're trying to make a uh, resource allocation decision. Let's look at genetic uh, or bee colony genetic structure and let the, use that to make help us make a better uh, allocation decision prior to a fault occurring. 
right? The goal is to kind of take these, these naturally inspired solutions, apply them together in order to improve system of system resilience. Like I said, in conclusion, we're looking at these two different approaches uh, with the goal of uh, creating a more resilient world for us all. Of course, uh, and closing, right, I have to do a few things. Also, always want to thank uh, my co-authors and the student team. Without them, none of this would be possible. Um, they, they truly uh, put in many hours into this effort and are greatly appreciated. Of course, I, I also want to appreciate the uh, GRFP and Pat Tillman Foundation for funding this work. It's greatly appreciated. I would also be a bad uh, department colleague or, or citizen if I did not mention that electrical engineering computer science at ERU is hiring and we are looking for including system engineers. i uh, be happy to talk to any of you that are interested about that after the presentation as well. Um, at this point, I wanna thank you for your, your attention. Thank you for inviting me, it's, it's always a pleasure and I'm happy to answer any questions you have as well. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Watson. Uh, that was a very uh, detailed, detailed presentation. Yeah. So I would like to open the floor for if you have any question for for Prof. Watson and if you have any comment uh, for his research, and you can just raise your hand up. Yeah. I I, I had a question. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brian. It was really an amazing presentation. Uh, so on slide 61, when you were telling about uh, different approaches, you said that you changed the logic uh, and then you uh, try the simulations. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you uh, when you change the logic, uh, isn't it that the system design at higher level is going to change and then the emergence that you would have is going to uh, affect it uh, entirely? Ah, that's a great question. So yeah, so you, you definitely can have propagating effects upward like we talked about at the beginning. So I think I have mm -hmm. a slide in here about this specific. I always add a little slide at the end just in case. Do I have it in here? I don't. Okay, so specifically when I talk about changing logic, what we were doing at this point is we had given the individual agents thresholds for when to make the decision to change between constituents. So that mm -hmm. is the that threshold is what was able to evolve over time or was changed over time. And it was super interesting, right? In one experiment, we gave them a uniform distribution of thresholds uh, similar to what you would see in an ant colony based on their their response to sugar or any other stimulus. Mm -hmm. And then the other one, we gave them all the same starting, but gave them the opportunity to learn and have their threshold change over time. Uh, kind of like the the decreases uh, sensitivity you get to repeated exposure to the same stimulus or increased sensitivity, depending on you know whichever phenomenon you're looking at. Mm -hmm. I think it, I think in this case it did not. It only impacted the question we were looking at because those are both specifically responses to the fault. So I agree. If you're not if you don't want to just go start changing all sorts of logic because then it will change those upper level properties. But because those are both fault response uh, logic. I think in this case there were no other were no other effects because it was only happened when there was a fault. Does that does that answer your okay. question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Thank, thank you. Good question. Uh, thank you, my end. Uh, Dr. Naidu, I think yeah, you can ask your question. Hi, Brian. Um, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, this is a topic of very much uh, interest to many of us. Particularly, I have been inspired by um, biorobotics. So, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> my question here is the classical dilemma, uh, which I consider is fairly important about um, quantity versus quality. Um, mm -hmm. When we talk about resilience or robustness, uh, I will give a small example. Um, if we go for bioinspiration, we have two kidneys. But somehow we don't have two hearts. It would have been nice if we had two hearts because that's the maximum failure which happens. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the historical data has shown that mm -hmm. uh, heart failure is more than kidney failure generally. So having said that, when you are having a twin aircraft, like to take an analogy, the twin twin engine aircraft, in which one engine fails, still one will work. So uh, there we have directly uh, copied like it's a bio inspiration, right? So we can call it that way. But how do you uh, how do you decide the dilemma about whether you should make one single system 
very robust by its uh, uh, what I call its quality, mm -hmm. or you go for a multiple uh, systems just to have a backup. Thank you. Yeah, so that 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 is the classic the classic question, right? And that that kind of goes back to the slide we were talking about. What is what is the traditional approaches to increase resilience versus some of these other approaches? Um, I think number one. So you mentioned aircraft, right? Those 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 fa failure critical applications, right? Resilience um, is is appropriate in a case often for those tail faults, right? Low probability, high impact, but you can't prevent them, and you want to be able to recover from them. I think when you have a case where you're, you're saying, okay, there's a probability that's that's not an extreme tail event, right? How do I then how do I then prepare myself? Right. And that's the case, robustness, especially if you can't tolerate the fault, robustness is a much better alternative. Um, I can tell you also for, for the research we're doing now, I tend to I tend to think a lot about scalability. Uh, and so we're we're looking a lot at many cheap, dumb assets rather than singular smart assets. Um, but I think it ultimately depends on, you know, an understanding of of what is what is the impact of the failure? I think it's an excellent question and, and one that you know you and I could both spend many decades thinking about. But thank ho you. hopefully that thank helps you. explain where I think about it a little bit. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, if you have any other question or comments, you can just raise up your hand. Yeah, I would like to uh, go ahead first. So in your presentation, uh, Prof. Watson, you said you your team developed like a custom metric for system yes. of system resilient measurement. Mm -hmm. So can you just walk us through like how was the metric developed and how did you did you validate the metric? Because, you know, sometimes when you are evaluating something, you can have a metric that works for this application and it doesn't work for another application. Yes. So can you just walk us through how you develop like your custom metric? That is a great, that is a great question. Uh, so, okay, so this this whole journey started with me saying, oh, we'll just use a metric and test all this ENA theory out. And yeah. then we couldn't find a metric that was cross context, right? Yeah. And so what you end up with, I think I have that one in here, maybe I don't. What you, here you go. So what you end up with is you end up with a bunch of different, um, basically the, the number one, the fault being analyzed has a major effect. So there's one, here's an, there's an example study where they looked at this specific region and said, okay, we're going to remove seven different power lines. So seven power lines here versus another city where they remove six water mains. How do you compare the resilience of those two? The second thing is that when you measure resilience, the recovery strategy becomes a big deal. So hmm. the actual recovery strategy being used in the different cities can impact your resilience measurement a lot. So that that was kind of our, our, our fundamental um, challenge. Uh, and so what we what we looked at was what are the key characteristics of systems of systems? Um, so some of the key characteristics are these ideas of cascading faults. Um, we also looked at the independence of the different constituents. And what we realized was, okay, well, we can take a network and we can use the, gra the graph structure to figure out how long it takes for energy to cycle through a system. Then what we'll do is we'll take that time, and we actually did 63.2% of that time based on for, uh, first order control, our first order response for, first order, for control theory, and said, let's insert the fault for that long, and then remove the fault, and then measure it for that long again. So the total time measured is twice that 63.2%. Okay. All right, so that's that's the basic theory. And then we break each link one at a time, look at the measures of performance, right? So okay, your other question is much more important. How do we validate it instead of just saying, yeah. here's the equation? Um, so the initial paper, we looked at both a oyster reef, which is this right here, system, and we looked at a military system of systems, which involved intelligence sharing between ground and air agents. And we not only showed that it worked, but we showed that some of our assumptions, it was, it was, it was robust to. So for example, at 63.2, we showed that we still got a, a, a consistent measure of resilience, right? If it was 63, 70, 50. The other thing we did is we said, okay, um, there's different types of errors. There's the errors you know are going to happen, which I think is a type one, and the ones you don't, which is a type two or vice versa. 
And so we expose the system to a large number of type two errors and then check the resilience of that with a random block, random failure, random um, duration and compare those resilience measurements to our actual calculated metric to see how they stacked up. The final thing we did in a separate paper, uh, which went to the IMAC conference for the, the mechanical engineers in the room, what we did is we said, okay, there's ecosystem theory that says this ecosystem shape should be the most resilient, specifically things like triangularity, number of layers, things like that. And we calculated resilience using our metric for each of those shapes and showed that our metric correlated with higher resilience shapes of ecosystems as expected. So we use kind of ecosystem theory as our ground truth saying, oh, it should be this shape, it should have this number of levels, that should be more resilient. And we showed uh, that that was the case using uh, the, the metric. So those are, those are some of the main ways we validated it. But yeah, you're exactly right. It's easy It's easy to invent an equation and it's it's much more challenging to make sure the equation means something. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, for the detailed answer. Yeah. Uh, Professor Farouk has some question and comments. Uh, uh, this is very interesting. Uh, what you're dealing with are creating models that are abstractions of reality. Yes. But I heard you mention that you were going to use game theory. Game we theory. do not use game theory for our work. Okay. Game theory is, is one of the approaches that is used to explore emergence. But we we personally have limited, we have limited interaction with game theory. Right. But, but anyways, yeah. So game theory is, in, to, the use of in, uh, game theory is incorrect. And the reason for that is that in game theory, the objective uh, uh, when you use optimization, the objective has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And so your objectives are not perfect. And so game theory is out mm -hmm. in the traditional way. We have shown how you can use game theory when the models are incomplete and inaccurate. So if you're interested in using game theory, we can show you how that can be done. Excellent. Yeah, I will do yeah, we'll definitely follow up to get get some of those. I think it's an area that we would, I think we would be remiss not to expand into it at some point. But yes, we 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 do very very little with game theory at this point. So I'm just telling you, there's an opportunity there. Yeah. If you're interested to use it correctly. Perfect. The second Excellent. thing is that you have you have uh, the you're going to be using models that are, uh, are abstractions of reality. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with the solutions that you get? Yeah. Because the solutions that you get are also fictitious in a way mm -hmm. to say, how do you deal with that? Yeah. That is, I think, I think the, the, so the key thing here is to be very clear about the claims we're making, right? So the claim I am making is not, you show me a network structure and I will tell you its resilience. Because you're right, there's an abstraction piece, right? There's, there's all sorts of unknowns. The claim we are making is that given a network structure, if you make changes to, to create a new network structure with this type of graph theory, we expect the resilience to improve. And the way we, we've, the, the foundation for that claim is that we've applied it to many different models with many different assumptions and shown that for the same type of change, you see an improvement. But I think it's very right. I think I think trying to make a detailed future predictive claim or is, well, limited, limited, uh, limit, not, not necessarily possible, right? So I think you have to be very clear in your, in your at least for me, I try to be very clear in my writing and in, in, in what I present that what, what our claim is. But yeah, you're exactly right. So the third, thing which is very interesting to me mm -hmm. is that you're talking about resilience. Mm -hmm. okay. The idea of resilience from a supply network perspective is that you bring it back mm -hmm. to the state that it is. For example, the slide you're showing, 78, mm -hmm. you're saying you bring it back to the state it's in. Okay. Now, in essence, when you do that, you're looking at it from a cyber physical perspective. Because in a cyber physical perspective, there's no evolution. All you're saying is bring it back to the same state. Mm -hmm. But you have the opportunity when you're dealing with this problem that if the system fails, we can change 
what we have to do new things. Mm -hmm. That does not appear to be in your case. In other words, you're not looking at evolution. You have drawn the boundary and said, I'm only going to live within this boundary. Nature does not live within its boundary. Nature keeps changing. Mm -hmm. So that aspect of nature, you have not taken into account. And I think you should, and you can. I think that's, I think that's an excellent point. I think, yeah, I think... I think we focused a lot on what has nature already done, but we haven't included. We, you're right. The, the time scale we're looking at is much shorter than what nature has demonstrated. But you see, nature yeah. evolves. Mm -hmm. That's that. That's the emergent property of nature. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of literature, particularly by a fellow by the name of John Gerrow, who says that a a natural system can be modeled using function, behavior, and structure. Mm -hmm. So you have the environment for a biological system. The environment changes. And so the biological system has the opportunity to change either its function, its behavior, or its structure. So for example, the function changes when a land animal becomes a sea animal or a sea animal becomes a land, land animal. That's one way in which it's gone. In other ways, there's been adaptation, the behavior changes, the way in which they, uh, what food they eat and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Or the structure changes. Uh, they grow uh, 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 different ways in which they can uh, 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 hands and feet and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So there is rich literature associated with that. Mm -hmm. And I think you will benefit by thinking along those lines. No, I, I think so as well. Thank you. Yeah. I'm I definitely will look into that. No, that's excellent. And if you want papers or ideas on that, uh, we looked at this uh, in the early 2000s. Okay. In fact, we had an NSF grant to take a look at this. We can share things with you. Oh, fantastic. That'd be, that'd be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you, Nuraya. Uh Thank you, uh, Prof. Farooq. Uh, so is there any other question for our guest speaker, Mervyn? And also, you can always, uh, if you don't have a question now, you can always send a mail to uh, Prof. Watson. Yes. Uh, he will be willing to reply you. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Then uh, what we typically do, Brian, would you like mm -hmm. to have a closing statement? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, let's see. So yeah, so I think I think I would uh, just close number one, saying thank you again for the opportunity to to come and present. Um, I really appreciate the the interesting questions and discussion following as well. I think number one, hopefully I've given you all something to think about, and you've given me a few things to think about, which is always kind of the, the ultimate goal of these kind of interactions. Um, we will continue in our group uh, to try and figure out ways that we can we can support resilience. Future efforts, I mentioned we were going to talk a little bit about that. We're kind of looking in several areas, specifically um, looking at how do we get these things out to the real world? So partnering with some companies, trying to see if we can actually give them some algorithms they can use as they make decisions. Uh, we're looking more into those individual agent behaviors. So we're currently in the process of building uh, 25 uh, very dumb, very cheap robots that will help us test some of these uh, approaches. Uh, and then we're also looking, you know, at some of those fundamental theory questions. How do you measure resilience? Is resilience scalable? Things like that. Um, but I always appreciate the opportunity to share our work. Uh, appreciate the good questions. Um, I hope this has given all, all of you something to think about and, and know that, you know, there are answers out there in nature. Uh, it's just us, up for us to find them and transfer them. So thank you again. Yeah. Yeah, right. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Watson, for the great presentation. And it was very enlightening because like that's not like my background, but I was able to follow the presentation and uh very like it was so detailed and uh it was uh, it was a very good presentation. Thank you. Um so if anyone has any other question for you, would uh they would send you an email. Um thank you. We hope would we'll be inviting you like in the future again for to present to our audience. Um, yeah, Excellent. so Prof. Farouk, yeah, Prof. Farouk, do you have any concluding uh, closing statements? Yes, it was an outstanding presentation. I think uh, uh, it stimulated a lot of thinking and talk, and we, I would certainly like to continue the dialogue with Brian. Yes, I'm going to, I'm going to stop recording as is our usual practice, and then 